Hey, my name is Jeff. I'm one of the teaching team members here at Rainier View, and we are so excited that you're joining us today for our series, Missing Peace. And around Christmas time, we talk a lot about peace and peace on earth and goodwill towards men and all that kind of stuff. But often the reality is that peace eludes us, particularly around the holidays. And so today we're going to be talking about in our series, uh, Missing Peace, what do I do when I'm disappointed with God? Because the reality is in life, there is a lot of disappointment. Life is full of disappointment. Uh, And so it reminded me of a time where we had a family vacation and we had a disappointing experience on a river and why my family will never do a tube float again. So how this came about, we were, we like to camp in the summer. We do the tent and the whole thing still and down in the dirt and it's wonderful. And, but we like to get away. Like we like, again, not like roughing it, but real campsites and get some peace and quiet. But we had some friends and they wanted to camp, but they had never camped. And so they wanted a bit more of a bougier camping experience. They wanted some amenities and they wanted this, that, and the other thing. And so we found this kind of Jellystone-esque style campground that had um, all of these kind of things that, that they wanted and would be uh, kind of better fit, but it was, it was more crowded. Uh, and so as we got closer to the date that we selected, all of our friends had bailed. And so we start out on our summer vacation and we hit the road and we arrive at this uh, campsite and it's a little disappointing for us because it's just so much more crowded and it's it's not this peaceful retreat. Uh, Instead, this kind of, again, this kind of campground with all these amenities and and all this stuff going on. It was kind of more of like a cross for me between a NASCAR rally like tailgate and an overcrowded preschool. It was the opposite of how I wanted to start my summer uh, vacation and experience. But, um, but I had found something that I think would kind of redeem this campsite that we started our trip at. And so it was a, it was a tube float on a river. And it's like, perfect. Uh, we're going to have three to four hours just floating down a river. It's going to be so just peaceful, exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, you know, this is going to be great. And so I should have known by this sketchy van that dropped us off at the, at the you know, drop-in point that this, this outfit wasn't super concerned about the experience that we would have on the river because that day the river was dead still. It was not flowing at all. Uh, it was in most parts, there was a, a little bit here and there, but for the most part, it was painfully slow. And so to the point at which, uh, even with walking parts of it, uh, what should have been a three to four hour tube float experience down a river turned into eight hours in the baking summer sun. Uh, and, and it just continued to kind of get worse, right? As the day went on, uh, my wife Amy and my daughter Kobe, uh, they are both fair. And so they're just burnt. They need more than one application of sunscreen and direct summertime sunshine. Um, I'm trying to walk some of this back and, and drag the tubes. And there's sections where my feet are just plunging into the silt of the riverbank, like up to my thigh. And so it was just not a fun experience. We finally float back and make it back as it's almost dark by the time we get back to our campground. We figure out how to shower and get some food and we go to bed. And so to this day now, my family will never ever do a tube float experience again. But the question is, were we going to allow the beginning of our trip, because this was kind of a road trip and we were going to several different spots, were we going to allow the beginning of our trip, the disappointment with this tube float failure of an experience, ruin the rest of our vacation? And so the answer, fortunately for us, was no. We went on to have some of our most just uh, favorite memories of uh, a summer road trip. We went on to camp at Mammoth Caves in Kentucky, and there's a national park there, and a beautiful campground, spread out, spacious, 
clean, and most importantly for me, quiet. Uh, our kids just had these, uh, this chance to have this really cool, unique experience where uh, just the kids were able to go with a park ranger and crawl into these tiny spaces in this massive cave structure. Uh, we stopped at Dino World, and it's just the perfect kind of roadside America, just kitsch kind of culture thing. And uh, it just, again, the kind of stuff that we love to explore and, and see when we're traveling. And finally, we ended up this trip by going to the, the Canadian side of uh, Niagara Falls and just one of the most amazing natural wonders in the world, right? And so here's the thing. We could have allowed that initial disappointing experience at the beginning of the trip uh, ruin the rest of our vacation. We could have allowed that to color everything, but fortunately we didn't. And, and so it's one thing to deal right with disappointment on a family vacation. It always makes for a good story anyways afterwards. Uh, but it's one thing to just have a little bit of disappointment around a vacation with our family. It's another thing entirely to struggle with disappointment when it comes to following and pursuing God in our lives. What do we do then when we're in this spot where we have this gap between how we think God should act and be working in our lives and what we experience? And so that's what we're looking at this morning because uh, many of us have feelings of disappointment around who God is in our lives and how we want him to work and we don't know what to do with those. Maybe you're joining us this morning and maybe for you, you're holding on to hurts that you just can't seem to reconcile your pain with God being good. And so there's disappointment that creeps in. Or maybe you've tried really hard to pursue God. You really want to, you've tried to pray, you've tried to read your Bible, but all you kind of get is this feeling of silence or confusion and, and just God doesn't seem present like you think he should be. And so again, you may have tried to pursue God, but it's been a disappointing experience for you. And so you're wondering, what do I do now? Uh, or maybe, maybe for you, you're just kind of a bit salty that somebody's, uh, God's working in somebody else's life in a way that he's not working in your own life. That uh, you think, man, I am working harder. I, I, I'm living with more character than somebody else. And so why are they getting so much more seemingly blessed than I am? Why do they have better relationships than I do? Why are they getting promotions when I'm not, right? And we can look at others' uh, experiences and we can begin to get a little cynical and jaded about, well, why should I bother with you, God, if you're going to honor this person in this way or, or allow them to have all this amazing stuff in their lives and then I'm not getting to have part of that? It's easy to allow disappointment to creep in when that's where our headspace is at. Now, here's the thing. It makes very little sense for us to pretend like we're not disappointed with God, okay? He already knows if that's what we're thinking and feeling. And so it's best to just name it, bring it out in the open. It's not a secret or surprise to him what you're thinking and feeling. And so what if you began to just be able to be a little bit more honest about where you're at? Now, for some of us, maybe we are a little bit further down the road in being faithful to pursue God. And we've seen time and time again of how he's shown up in our lives. And we've actually built a bank of stories in our own life where we can know that God is faithful despite our circumstances. And that's amazing. That's great. We should tell those stories. But here's the reality. Your neighbor may not have those same experiences and stories. In fact, in our church at Rainier View or wherever you're attending or going, uh, maybe, that there are people who are carrying the weight right now of disappointment with how they expect God to work and they don't know what to do with it. And they feel stuck because of this very question. And so here's the thing, when we are disappointed with God, it might seem weird, it might seem counterintuitive at first, but we are in the very exact place that we need to be in order to see God at work in our lives in a brand new and a fresh way. Because when our plans get wrecked, we can see God's purposes on display in a brand new way, in a, in a bigger and uh, in in deeper way than we currently are. And so this Christmas, what we want to do is we're in the Christmas season here, if you're joining us live, um, let's not explain away the pain, the frustration, uh, the loss, the confusion that, that we're experiencing in the season. Let's not, let's, don't dismiss it. Let's not do that. But let's also not miss out on how God is trying to get our attention in the midst of those struggles that we might be dealing with right now. 
Because I wonder, are we so wrapped up in our own expectations of how we want God to show up in our lives that we would miss it if he actually walked in the room right now with us? And so again, when we experience disappointment, it is often because of our own expectations rather than what God has actually promised us. When it comes to our disappointment with pursuing God, often our problem is wrapped up in our own expectations of who God should be or how he should act rather than what God has actually promised us in his word. And so uh, this morning we're going to turn our attention to uh, a familiar passage for many of us. We're going to look at the Christmas accounts in the Bible, which in the Gospels, those are in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. And these really are, when we say the Christmas story, these are the birth narratives of Jesus' birth. Uh, and so when I was rereading these, uh, these accounts, something struck me, in particular in Matthew's Gospel. There is a whole lot of disappointing things that go down in a couple of very short chapters. There is a lot of disappointment packed into an account that we typically think of as as happy and joyful. And so I want to unpack four of the scenes that we see here uh, and how they could could have led to disappointment in the lives of others and yet how we can learn to see who God truly is and how he's at work and what his promises to us actually are. And so uh, the first kind of moment that we're going to look at is the, uh, the moment right here in Matthew 1 that our family backgrounds can disappoint us. We learn from Matthew 1 that our family backgrounds can be a source of disappointment. Uh, and so Matthew and Luke actually both start with a genealogy. Uh, and so a genealogy is kind of like an old school OG 23andMe. Uh, this, is, this is just the way they did it back in the day uh, to know where you came from. And so what's interesting in Matthew's gospel is that there are some shady characters in Jesus' family tree. Uh, and so in the gospel of Matthew, we see this curated list. It's a curated list of uh, three groups of 14 individuals. And so it's not a complete list of his life, um, but again, it's, it's one for narrative purposes that he's crafted in a certain way. And so uh, let's go ahead and look at uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 6 with me to see one of these individuals in Jesus' family tree. And so it says, And Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now, it's interesting uh, how Matthew chooses to record this particular branch of Jesus' family tree here. Uh, He's saying that Jesus came from, in his family tree, like his great-granddad times 20, King David, or so, it's not actual, but, you know, way back, uh, Right. How does he describe this ancestor, King David? Well, he says, uh, he points to the fact that Uriah was one of David's most trusted soldiers and a friend. And while Uriah was serving in active duty combat for his country, King David was back at his palace falling in lust with Uriah's wife. And then to the point to add and compound that sin of David's life, he actually has his friend Uriah killed in battle so that he could rightfully uh, take his wife from him, okay? And so that's just a low point, one of the few low points in the life of King David, who is otherwise one of the most exemplary leaders in the nation of Israel and one of the more exemplary, exemplary individuals in Jesus' family tree. There's a lot worse individuals in this genealogy that are listed. And so maybe you and I can breathe a little bit easier now about our own uh, maybe angst uh, around our family tree and maybe our family systems, Uh, that there's this ugliness in Jesus' family history that doesn't derail God's purposes, that doesn't doesn't disqualify uh, what God could do in the life of Jesus. And so the question for us is, are we going to let disappointment with our family tree, with our genealogy um, even, stop us from seeing how God is faithful, how God is at work in our lives right now? There may be some things that you have inherited, like literally in your genes from your family that's been passed on to you, uh, that you think maybe could get in the way of a relationship with God. Uh, Pete Gazzaro says it this way. He says that while Jesus may be in your heart, grandpa is in your bones. 
But here's the thing that I want us to know, that even though grandpa might be in your bones, we've inherited some things from our families that have been passed down to us, whether experientially or even like literally in the makeup and the composition of who we are, uh, that Jesus was born, that we might experience redemption and freedom from those things, that there is the ability to truly experience new life and healing, no matter what has come from, through our family line. We can change that family script. But the question is, are we gonna allow that disappointment to continue to be based upon my expectations rather than God's promises? Again, I get disappointed when I get my expectations wrapped up in who I think God should be and how I think God should act rather than who he's claimed to be and what he's actually promised me. Well, second moment that can be disappointing for us uh, is that we can see that our romantic relationships can be a source of disappointment. And so maybe you've had some weird dating stories, but I challenge you to compare notes against Joseph, okay? Consider Joseph's situation in Matthew 1, verse 18. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Okay, so here's Joseph's situation. Mary's like, hey Joseph, even though we haven't had sex, I'm pregnant. But it's, it, and it wasn't somebody else from the village. This is a supernatural birth. Are you cool with that? And I gotta be like, Joseph at this point, no, this is not cool at all. Like, this, is, this is so not what he envisioned for this, uh, for this marriage relationship that he was moving towards. And yet he had a choice. Joseph had a choice. Am I gonna be disappointed with God because of the way this, uh, this uh, engagement is turning out? Or am I gonna trust God still? And I love the fact that Joseph trusts God before, before he gets this visit from an angel, before what God does next. Because he was gonna go down this path where he was gonna choose not to dishonor Mary. He was gonna just divorce her quietly and do the right thing. And I'm sure he's thinking at this point, like. I have got to find a new matchmaker. So matchmakers in ancient culture, they, they're like the dating apps of, the, of, of you know, uh, olden times. Uh, and so he's gotta be thinking like, where do they find these people? Uh, and so here's the thing. Joseph though, even though that's his situation, he still wants to pursue God. He still wants to do what is right. He's not allowing this romantic relationship to bleed into disappointment with God himself. And so because of that, look what we see as we pick back up in Matthew 1, verse 20. It says, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And so I think that God is able to show up in this way in Joseph's life in part because he didn't get his expectations wrapped up in pointing blame and disappointment to God. He kept those things separated. And so because of that, he was able to see how God was at work. And so again, for you and I, is our disappointment more about our expectations rather than what God has promised us? Well, the third, third moment of disappointment we see in the, in the passage that I want to look at uh, is that we could be disappointed because of all the terrible things that are happening in our world. And we see an, an example of this, uh, that there, really nothing has changed, nothing is new. That there is terrible and horrific violence that human beings inflict upon one another and that we've just been continuing this from the very beginning. If you want to go back all the way to the beginning, you can look in Genesis, at the beginning of Genesis, and you can see uh, that, that Cain kills his brother Abel out of jealousy, right? And so people have just been perpetuating this kind of uh, violence over and over again throughout human history. And so we see this terrible story of violence in Matthew's gospel, and it could lead us to, to be really disappointed with God, allow, how can God allow these things to happen? And so let's look at what happens in Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. 
It says, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child uh, to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. And sadly, we live in a world that is unfortunately all too similar to the violence that Herod perpetuates. That we live in a world with, where those in power continue to wield it against those that do not have it. And we can forget that this Christmas story is a true story. And it really captures the best of humanity as well as the worst of humanity. And while this, this morning is not the time and space to explore um, the problem of evil in a, in a full way, uh, can I give you one thought, one, I think, helpful thought to process this particular disappointment with God? Let me ask you this. When you read of Herod's activity here, how do you know Herod's actions are evil? Right? Because the vast, vast 99.99% of us, instinctively, we know what we read about here, that what Herod did was wrong, was evil. But how do we know that? We can only know that something is wrong and evil uh, because that means there's an absence of a good. There's a good that has been violated. There's a good that's not being lived out. And so the very experience, the very reading of an evil like this points to the reality that we know, if we're being honest with ourselves, I believe, that there is a good that's being violated. There's a, there's a good that, that we long to see happen and be fulfilled. And so the question is, does the, the presence of evil, does it cause you to be disillusioned with God? And if so, can I offer a counter kind of point to that? Maybe rather than being disillusioned with God because of the evil and the wrong in our world, allow the presence of evil and wrongness to draw you closer to the goodness of God because we need it all the more in the face of the difficulties and the evils and the wrongs that we see and experience in our world. It speaks to there being a good and a good God that is present in the midst of our sinfulness. But again, is our disappointment wrapped up with our own expectations of how I expect God to act, what I expect God to be able to do, rather than who God has said he is and, how, and the promises that he's actually made to you and, and I. I want to wrap up with one more moment out of, out of the Gospel of Matthew that touches on disappointments that we experience. Um, we might be disappointed when circumstances just continually keep uh, causing us to come up short. Uh, that we continually are disappointed with our circumstances and nothing looks like what we planned for in our lives. Here's the thing, because the reality of the Christmas story is Jesus became a refugee. Uh, he, was, he had to flee for his life with the, as a baby. Um, his parents took him away. He flees for his life and, and he's on the run. And we just read that they had to flee to Egypt to escape Herod's uh, evil kind of infanticide. And so let's pick up and see what what happens for them. Uh, in, Ma in Matthew 2, picking up in verse 19, it says, After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. This was not the start to the life that Mary and Joseph had envisioned for themselves. These circumstances have continually been disappointing and challenging for them. But again, they have a decision to make. Would they give in to the disappointment? Would they allow that to cloud over uh, how they viewed God or would they continue to see God at work and continue, continue to see God's goodness being extended to them in the midst of difficult situations? 
Because again, even thinking about Jesus and Mary on top of that, uh, by age 30, Jesus has lost his father. We don't know how he passed away, but likely he passed away much, much earlier, losing his dad at a young age. And so maybe, maybe you're surprised at this brief Christmas uh, narrative, this birth narrative of Jesus, and you thought, this is joy on earth and peace and all this good stuff. And how is there so much disappointment in this story, right? Um, but yet somehow it still is a story that God uses to bring hope to billions of people around the world, particularly around Christmas time. And so what about you and I? What will we do when we face disappointment with how we expect God to work or how we want to see him uh, at work in our lives? What do we do? Will we continue to be disappointed because of our expectations or will we be drawn closer to who God says he is and draw closer to the promises that he's actually made us in our own lives? And so I want to close by just sharing one story. Um, A few months ago, we had a sermon series called Bless, and it's all about uh, how we can love our neighbors and change the world around us by practicing five simple practices. And so one of those practices is learning to share our story. And so we asked uh, for, for people at Rainier View to contribute their stories, share those stories with us. And so what I want to do is I want to read one of the stories that came in from that uh, sermon series, because it's such a beautiful picture of how we can give in to our feelings of disappointment towards God, or we can see how he's been at work even when things don't look great. And so I'm going to read uh, this story now. She starts, the man who was introduced, the man who introduced me to Jesus was far from a saint. As a young man, he'd gotten a girl pregnant, abandoned her, and then denied paternity of his son. Matt later married, divorced, then abandoned another son. He hid out in Canada to avoid paying child support and alimony and got a job working for my uncle. Matt was fully employed in Canada and while sneaking down to Oregon to collect monthly unemployment checks at a P.O. box. He met my mom at this time, who'd been abandoned by my dad for her best friend. That best friend had a little girl my age with the same name as me, and they would eventually become uh, his new family. I was three, and my sister was five. And so Matt moved us from Canada to the States and eventually married my mom. He wasn't a good or loving man by any standard, but it was he who began taking our family to church. He led us to a strong Bible-believing community where our hearts were all immediately receptive to the good news of our Savior. I was five years old at the time, And although I can't remember the moment of my conversion, I remember being open to and in awe of everything Jesus. Matt would later give me a baby brother. This would be the third son that he would abandon along with the rest of us when my brother was five and I was 15. He snuck away one night after emptying the bank accounts, leaving us financially and emotionally devastated. But because of the gift he gave us, the introduction to Jesus we were able to endure and press on. Because we were so dependent on God for everything that came next, we learned big lessons and trust about God's faithfulness. And while Matt left a legacy of pain in his wake, he also began a legacy that changed everything for the better. There had been no faith anywhere on either side of my parents' families. In fact, there had been hostility. But our encounter with Jesus through Matt altered the trajectory of our family history. My mother, my sister, my brother, my children, we will all be together for eternity because Matt introduced us to Jesus. I've had the incredible privilege of raising my kids with answers to things in life that I would have had no answers for. I've had a faithful father and given them a father who will never let them down or abandon them. I have 45 years worth of stories about Jesus to share because one imperfect man knew something and shared something that would change our lives, our history, and our eternity forever. It's a pretty amazing story. It's a pretty amazing perspective to, again, not allow our individual expectations and our experiences to say, oh, I don't want God in my life anymore. Oh, I'm not interested in pursuing him if this is the way it's going to go down. But to be able to see him at work and his faithfulness in the midst of so many difficult circumstances. 
So I wonder for you and I, what if we took the time to reflect back on our lives? Just take a, take a moment, maybe later today, to think about some of the, the big events and moments. And rather than see a string of frustrations and losses and disappointments and meaningless hurts, what if we began to see that somehow God has been at work through imperfect people, sometimes very imperfect people, in order to get our attention? That somehow the infinite God of the universe has been revealing just enough of himself to us that we can begin a relationship with, with him even today without him coercing us into one, with us freely choosing one. And so if you're joining us live, I would encourage you right now, if you know you want to begin pursuing God, you want a real relationship with God because of what Jesus has already accomplished for you, raise your hand in the, in the chat feature. One of our online service hosts would love to connect with you and hear your story and explain how you can begin a real relationship with God today. If you're, if you're catching this on demand later on, message us, reach out no matter where you're at, no matter what your life looks like right now. It is not too late to turn what you might view as disappointment into the way God has been at work to bring you into a relationship with him, for you to begin to experience healing and new life. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, who can we share our story with? God has given you profoundly important moments in your life to be an encouragement to others. Who can you share those with? Who can you invite to, to join you at church, to hear the goodness of God, to see that even though I might think that I should be free to be disappointed with God and write him off, that maybe, maybe people will take a second chance if we're willing to share our stories, if we're willing to extend an invitation. Hey, thank you so much for giving us some of your time today. We hope that you'll join us next week as we continue in our series, Missing Peace. Hey, I'm Mike, the digital ministry pastor here. If you like what you saw today, we invite you to click that subscribe button and hit the notification bell to be updated on everything we have going on here. Also, if you need prayer, if you have any questions, or you just want to reach out, be sure to email me at mikep at rainerview.org. Thanks again for being part of the RBCC family today.